Welcome back to our discussion of the role of posterior wall isolation in ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation. Part one of our, of our discussion focused on the Kapla study as presented by Peter Kistler at ESC. Part two will now focus on the converged study and hybrid convergent ablation as published in CIRQP by Dr. Dave Delergio. I'd like to welcome back our discussants. Welcome back, Dr. Delergio of Emory University School of Medicine. Thank you. And welcome back, Peter Kistler of Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks very much, Dan. Now discussing, you know, the, the Converge trial. And so, you know, 149 patients randomized in a two-to-one fashion for the hybrid convergent procedure. And I think, you know, I was very grateful that you created this visual abstract. You know, I think it's a very nice summary of, of what, what you did. So why don't you walk us through what you did? Sure. And thank you very much. Well, the Converge trial is a different trial than Kapla or other trials that are comparing posterior wall isolation to not posterior wall isolation or different types of posterior wall isolation. We were really interested in this trial in what the effect of adding an epicardial approach to create transmural lesions, which we could validate were transmural, would have uh, compared to a standard approach. So many people have noted that we're comparing two different arms, posterior wall isolation plus PVI versus PVI only. Uh, and I think that that is in keeping with what Peter just uh, presented. And we're curious about the addition of the posterior wall. Would it affect the patients? Our enrolled uh, population was somewhat different. We allowed patients uh, with persistent AFib, but regardless of duration. So 42% of the patients had longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation. In other words, greater than a year of continuous AFib. And we allowed left atrial size up to six centimeters. So we had a fairly um, mixed population, but also a fairly sick atrial population in our study. And the results were fairly dramatic. Um, pulmonary vein isolation with the roof line and right atrial flutter line as our standard approach in the bottom uh, figure uh, did far less well than those patients who had the epicardial ablation as well. And the endocardial dwell time for the study group was substantially lower because um, part of the pulmonary vein isolation set had already been done epicardially, as you can sort of visualize from the figure. There was a large reduction in atrial fibrillation throughout the entire population of uh, persistence and longstanding persistence. But interestingly, the magnitude of difference was substantially greater in those with longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation. And that actually drove the statistical significance of the trial. So we've also provided information and it's in press uh, right now under review of the longstanding persistent group only, uh, which had an even longer um, uh, or better outcome, which persisted through 18 months of analysis as well. So a point or a question I have about your study, now you compared it to a roof line, right? Endocardial pulmonary vein isolation and roof line. Um, and you comment on, you know, kind of some of the, you know, controversy or discrepancy between roof line and true posterior wall, but why make the choice to compare it against the roof line versus a posterior wall isolation? It's a good question. Um, the lesion set considered the control was developed at a time. Uh, I think it's it's actually a almost a different generation where we didn't have all of the modern tools available. So some of the patients did not have, for example, force sensing. When the trial was designed, that was in its infancy. And we asked for surgical input. And surgeons felt that um, a roof line would prevent macro reentrant atrial arrhythmias, uh, and it was a better test. In other words, did actual obliteration of the posterior wall do anything more than just a roof line, which would prevent macro reentrant atrial arrhythmias? So it's an interesting question. 
Um, there are a lot of questions about how durable those roof lines could be over time. I think we all know that that is a challenging thing to do, even with the best of tools. But that was the genesis of it. It had a lot to do with the tools available. The um, We couldn't do posterior wall isolation at this time because the FDA felt that it was potentially too risky. <clears throat> so it was not considered an appropriate approach at the time the trial was actually conceived. Um, otherwise, we may have had sort of a capla arm versus an epicardial ablation arm. But, but it uh, does show that addition of that those transmural lesions on the posterior wall seem to have a dramatic effect. Exactly. So then I would like you to, you know, take us through this next slide here, talking a little bit about your primary safety events. I think in the in the study, you at a certain point you started giving uh, NSAIDs to the convergence arm because of some of these inflammatory to pericardial effusions. So comment a little bit about what you found as far as safety endpoints. Certainly. Well, what we learned is that um, the epicardial ablation is fairly irritating. And I think um, it's something that surgeons tend to take for granted, but we actually had to sort of learn as we went. So um, the driver of adverse events was a late pericardial effusion, and it was often approached by either dra drainage, either uh, percutaneously or um, or in some cases, it was done by a recreation of the um, pericardial window that had been done for the original procedure. These were not, strictly speaking, uh, tamponade episodes like we kind of have all experienced rarely in the lab uh, where you had an acute perforation. These were patients who went home fine, but seven to 14 days later, actually seven to 20 days later, um, had accumulation of pericardial fluid. So by being more aggressive with anti-inflammatory agents um, around the time of the procedure and continuing them for up to a month afterwards, um, colchicine being the most popular, well, we have almost eliminated this problem. Uh, there is still some tendency towards pericardial irritation, but it's easy, uh, much easier for us to mitigate if we're um, aggressive about the anti-inflammatory agents. So tell me a little bit more about the convergent procedure, how well is tolerated, and based upon your data, kind of where does it fall in to as far as treatment of these persistent, long-standing persistent patients at experienced centers? Is this your first time ablation, your second time? Kind of where, where do you find that? Well, clinical use has shown that if we really believe that a durable isolation of the posterior wall is important to the successful ablation, this has been a very good go-to tool. Uh, so I tend to use this in the long-standing persistent population because this really has been shown to be much more effective than standard ablation. I think we all know clinically too that getting a durable isolation by endocardial means alone in someone with an enlarged left atrium or substantially enlarged left atrium and long-standing persistent AFib is quite clinically challenging and there tend to be uh, recurrences of conduction because of the length we have to cover along the floor and roof. I think the thickness of the roof and the complexity of the roof uh, tissue um, is uh, is remains a big factor. And I'm a, I'm generally in favor of isolating the posterior wall endocardially, but um, you know you have great cases and you have very difficult cases, and so it's not something we can reliably do endocardially, but we certainly can. Uh, get a durable response by the epicardial approach. I get referred a lot of patients who fail their ablations. It's very hard to know if isolating the posterior wall is what it's going to take to help those patients. That you sort of do on the fly. But as a first-line procedure for patients with long-standing persistent AFib or persistent AFib with advanced atrial pathology, I found this to be very helpful. And that extends to the heart failure population with reduced LV function. Um, or substantially enlarged left atria. Now, I, I'm going to now open up the discussion and hopefully, I mean, I think this is when things will get, you know, pretty interesting. And I'll put my next question to Peter. Uh, so, Peter, can you, you know, we we there are some differences between the study and different outcomes between the two different studies. Can you comment on those differences and why and, and kind of where you see the role of posterior wall isolation? in your practice and, in, and and based on the data? Yeah, so Dan, I suppose on the basis of Kapler, um, 
I would I would suggest that um, first time procedures for persistent AF up to twelve months. So not long standing persistent AF. PVI alone is the first procedure. And I think the jury's still out on what should be done in patients who are in long standing um, persistent AF. Um, it really is an important difference between Kapler. There are a number of differences between Kapler and Converge, but as Dave's alluded to, a lot more long-standing persistent AF patients, 42% in Converge versus around about 17% in Kapler. And Dave, you know, piggybacking on that, at the differences, and we're, I think you've already alluded to your overall practice as far as the post law goes, but anything, any further comments on the differences in outcomes? Yeah, I think well, it's it's a dif difficult um, comparison, Kapler versus Converge. I mean, Kapler, a, a lot larger study, 338 versus 153, the differences in longstanding. The LA size, interestingly, was similar between the two studies. Um, a more, a, a, a larger um, body mass, if you like, BMI 33 to 35 in Converge. I think also it's a little unfair. Converge is really in two procedures, whereas... Kapler is one procedure. So you've got the epicardial um, surgical approach followed by the endocardial PVI. And also when we talk about posterior wall isolation with Converge, we're restricted by the, um, it, the pericardial reflection. So you actually don't get as high as the roof. There's some really nice figures that Dave included in his paper, which show the need to come into cardially to get higher up on the roof and get that complete isolation of the posterior wall that you can get with catheters. But admittedly, the beauty, you know, the epicardial aspects of posterior wall isolation can be super challenging endocardially, particularly with esophageal temperature monitoring. Um, I mean, you look at the success of the PVI alone arm between the two studies, so about 52% with Kapler, but only 32% in Converge. And again, speaks to perhaps the differences in the proportion of longstanding um, persistent I think the other real important difference is, is the procedure duration really short for catheters, but much, much longer if you look at a combination of surgery and an endocardial. So we're looking at two admissions often. Um, the complications, much safer procedure with catheters than with surgery. You saw that there, 7.8% um, versus 2.9% in Kapler, and that was largely just with, um, with some heart failure. And then what about length of stay, cost, patient recovery catheters versus a combined approach. So that'd be all the sort of differences I would have thought, Dan. Oh, yeah. Dave's thoughts. yeah, Dave, go ahead. Let's, let's hear your thoughts. Well, I think the differences between the two trials are, are quite um, evident. And I really love the Kapla trial. I, I strongly believed it had to be done. And I have often wondered if I should always isolate the posterior wall in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. And I had actually done that for many years, um, but I do believe that it does not add something to all patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. And I think that's what Peter has shown us. Um, and there could be many reasons for that. In the converged trial, the, uh, the patients with run-of-the-mill persistent atrial fibrillation did not get much benefit uh, from adding the epicardial posterior wall ablation. And I think it's a really interesting question of why that is. And I think it's, um, I think Peter's paper is really important because I don't think it's necessarily telling us that posterior wall isolation is dead in all persistent atrial fibrillation patients. I completely agree, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's really bringing to the question of why and, you know, is it a substrate issue? If you look at some of the recently published things like decaf 2, I think that that makes us a little concerned because they did not, they were not able to show that targeting substrate, which often was the posterior wall, was beneficial. And I think if you look at um, stable SR2, um, which used similar kind of approach, but not MRI based, it was voltage mapping, they were not able to show a benefit. Um, and so we're gonna, I think, talk about additional data as well. I, but I think we're left wondering how we tailor our ablation or should we tailor our ablation? All right, thank you all for joining us for part two 
of the posterior wall persistent atrial fibrillation breaking news discussion. Stay tuned for part three. <laughs>